1966's The Face of Another is a Japanese drama thriller with horror elements from director Hiroshi Teshigahara and author Kobo Abe, who adapted his own novel into the film's screenplay. The story concerns a businessman named Okuyama whose face has been so badly disfigured that he dare not show it in public. This leads him to don an experimental, hyper-realistic mask that gives him the face of another, a random man who sells his visage for a small payday. As he acclimates to the mask, it changes more than just his appearance. I'm Sam, welcome to Brickwall Pictures, and welcome to my Essential Cinema series, where I highlight films that I consider to be some of the best ever made, and attempt to break down precisely why they're so great, and why I consider them essential viewing for cinephiles and or aspiring filmmakers. Teshigahara and Abe had just collaborated on Woman in the Dunes two years prior, which I also have a review for on the channel and I highly recommend. The two stars of Woman in the Dunes, Eiji Okada and Kyoko Kashida, both play smaller roles in the face of another. Once the main character, Okuyama, replaces his bandages for his new face, you might recognize the actor, Tatsuya Nakadai, from his staggering leading performance in the Human Condition trilogy, or from his many collaborations with Akira Kurosawa. Alongside Tashira Mifune, Nakadai was one of Kurosawa's go-to actors, and he's fantastic in the face of another, establishing an impressive presence in the early parts of the film, despite his face being 100% hidden behind bandages at all times. He brings so much characterization to the role through his body language and vocal performance alone. After Okuyama dons the mask and is growing acclimated to it, Nakadai was tasked with somehow making his own face look like a mask that he's wearing over a different face, and he nails that tall task. He's aided in part by some subtle makeup and prosthetics that hold up remarkably well for a film from the 1960s. But he also does wonders on a physical performance level by downplaying his facial expressions in a sedated sort of way and managing to feel like he's inside of himself with a layer of separation from the world around him. Nakadai somehow convinces you that his face is not his face until the character becomes increasingly inseparable from the mask. It's a unique feat that I don't expect many other actors could have ever pulled off. The nature of face replacement as the core focus of the plot is likely to conjure thoughts of two other films, one of which is completely different, but the other actually has quite a lot in common with the face of another. The first is John Woo's Face Off, that's the completely different one, but the film bears strong echoes of the 1960 French film Eyes Without a Face. Beyond the plot similarities, the two explore similar themes and both mind the uncanny to create a sense of unease. Where the former had a centerpiece face removal sequence, the latter has a centerpiece face application scene. Rather than drilling into the societal alienation experienced through the removal of one's visage, the face of another begins with the protagonist already submerged in that alienation, and instead explores his attempt to reintegrate back into the society that he was alienated from. Not as himself, but as another. With a new face comes a new identity, and with a new identity comes an entirely new life. Whether his shunning is forced upon him or is self-imposed is a point of contention for Okuyama. It's clear that his tarnished appearance has become a point of obsession that he can't personally move past. So he can't possibly accept that others could move past it either. <laughs> あなただってその気になりさえすれば。それは外国の文通相手や電話線の向こうにいる人間ならその通りだろうさ。しかし顔のない人間が自由になれるのは闇が世界を支配した時だけだ。だから深海魚は<笑> 
あんなグロテスクな顔になれたんじゃないか<笑>そんな例え話を持ち出してきた何が例えのもんか僕は年中この10倍もの暗闇の中に閉じ込められっぱなしなんだ The disfigurement was more than physical. His mind and soul have been disfigured as well. しかし僕は自分でも自分が化け物のように思えてくることがある。無理はせんことだ。ともかく考えすぎは特にいかんね。The injury filled him with self loathing, which radiates outward. He projects his disdain for himself onto those in his immediate vicinity and upon society as a whole. Do some people gawk at his bandaged face as he passes them on the street? Sure. But he projects open hostility into their gazes. His wife gets the worst of it, with Okuyama even admitting that he considered forcefully disfiguring her face to bring her to his level. He believes that the world perceives him as a monster, and part of him wants to embrace that perception. The face of another is all about identity, both internal and external. Who are you to society, and who are you to yourself? By wearing the face of another, you draw a clear separation between the two. Or so Okayama expects. Instead, the film questions whether trying to be someone else makes that who you are, or whether the real you is inextricable, even if you go to the furthest lengths possible in search of separation. This idea is explored in a pair of scenes in which an intellectually disabled girl encounters Okayama once in bandages and once in his new face, and instantly knows he's the same person despite his protestations. The film explains this in a regrettable way by comparing people with intellectual disabilities to dogs and suggesting that they identify people by smell instead of sight, which is quite disgusting and is the only moment of the film that suffers from its age. Luckily, it's a tiny moment that is immediately glossed over, and even more luckily, the film makes the same thematic point later on in a far more poignant way with Okayama's wife. Who's credited as just Mrs. Okayama, by the way, that's why I'm not addressing her by name. Okayama's wife also sees straight through his mask and knows her husband the instant she meets him under the guise of being a stranger. But instead of calling him out on this or reacting to his intentional subterfuge as he tries to seduce his own wife into having an affair with the stranger that he pretends to be, instead of calling him out, she goes along with it, playing into his escapist fantasy for both his and her own benefit. <sighs> It's escapism for her as well, and the film smartly takes the opportunity to draw a parallel between Okayama's mask and the act of wearing makeup. With the idea being that Mrs. Okayama and countless others wear masks every day too, but the mask of makeup is public facing and transparent, whereas Okayama's mask is a definitive act of deception. Like many of the best films, The Face of Another puts so many thoughts and questions and ideas into the viewers' heads, offering some answers, but leaving you with plenty to think about long after the credits have rolled. Much of the film's thought provoking queries surround the nature of identity and self, but I see a deeper layer that's subtler yet perhaps even more powerful. That area of thoughtful exploration concerns the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. It's never on the nose and is left entirely as subtext. The closest the film ever comes to addressing the subject directly is in this brief exchange. <laughs> まだ当分始まりそうにないわねまあ当分はねしかし明日のことは天気予報だってドクスパーテにはできないからなそうね戦争だってなんだって大抵は始まっちゃってから気がつくもんさ Taken at face value, this exchange could be seen as merely an aside, disconnected from the main plot. But it's enough to plant the subject in your mind and maybe get you to start connecting the dots in your head. The film is all about identity, that much is clear. So, why couldn't it be about cultural identity as well? 
World War II and the atomic bombs caused a seismic shift in the cultural identity of Japan. And you could argue that the country as a whole was left disfigured and searching for a new identity just like Okayama. Once you make that connection, everything Okayama does and experiences takes on a deeper meaning and becomes so much more thematically rich. On a more literal level, the bombs directly resulted in countless permanent disfigurements alongside all of the deaths. Even though Okayama's disfigurement wasn't caused by the atomic bombs, it was caused by a workplace explosion, and that parallel is clear. This profound subtext is part of what elevates the face of another from great to essential in my book. As are its cinematography, production design, and sense of atmosphere. Just like I said about Woman in the Dunes, The Face of Another is one of the best looking films of the 1960s. The same cinematographer shot both films, Hiroshi Sagawa, and unlike the majority of cinematographers who work frequently, Sagawa only ever shot four feature films, three of which were Teshigahara's films, and the other was from director Kinji Fukasaku of Battle Royale and Yakuza Papers fame. Together, the two Hiroshis crafted a visual style that was incredibly far ahead of its time, making both Woman in the Dunes and The Face of Another feel far more modern than films from 1964 and 1966, respectively, typically do. Sagawa mostly worked in documentaries, and while these films don't look at all like documentaries, coming outside of the world of typical narrative filmmaking likely helps Sagawa break away from the conventions of the time and push the visuals in bold new directions. Coming at things as an outsider often has unforeseen benefits like that. Beyond simply looking excellent, the film's cinematography and set design choices are both used to reinforce theme. Since Okayama's face is completely hidden behind bandages for almost half of the film, the visual inverse is shown. The human face becomes opaque, while walls become transparent. What you normally see and can't see are flipped upside down. Rather than being beholden to reality, the locations of the film are fluid, altering and distorting as they might in a dream. Everyday locations become surrealist landscapes at whim. The doctor's office especially changes in appearance practically every time we see it, distorting in lockstep with Okayama's internal and external transformation. Woman in the Dunes was a worldwide hit, with Teshigahara even becoming the first Japanese director nominated for the Best Director Academy Award a full 20 years before Kurosawa received the same honor. The face of another, however, was not met with the same level of universal acclaim. Quite the contrary. It's easy to lose sight of it so many years later after it's been reevaluated, but The Face of Another was widely considered to be a failure upon release, and it harmed the careers of all involved moving forward. Just like The Night of the Hunter, another film later rejudged as a masterpiece, some films are simply too far ahead of their times. Go watch The Face of Another, and watch Woman in the Dunes too if you've never seen it. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and subscribe and check out more of my stuff. Until next time.